makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix, live from Bank of America's Global Investor Summit in Rome. Now, here's what's coming up on today's program. Stocks struggle for momentum as investors eye U.S. factory inflation data due today for fresh clues on the Fed's rate path ahead. Meanwhile, the Greek central bank chief says the ECB must cut rates twice before the summer break iPhone maker Hon Hai reports its second straight quarter of strong profit growth as AI demand lifts sales and the clock is ticking for TikTok. The fate of the popular video app is now in the hands of the U.S. Senate after the House votes to force its Chinese owners to sell up or face a ban. The company tells employees its strategy remains the same. Plus, of course, I've been uh, speaking to a range of big names from Bank of America. There's plenty more to come now. At 9.30 UK time, we'll be joined by the bank's chief investment strategist, uh, Michael Hartnett. So let's also take a look at the European markets map. Now, a lot of investors, um, of course, focus on exactly what's been happening. The one thing that we need to watch out for is some of the inflation data and some of the things that we need uh, to keep an eye on. Now, the thing that I'm mostly watching is that for the moment, if you look at the CAC 40, we're seeing quite a lot of green, but the focus is not only of some of the data coming out of the U.S., but of course, some of the thoughts that the ECB could cut interest rates before anyone else. What does that mean for the future? What does that mean for some of the things that we need to look out for? On the Bank of Greece, Mr. Sornaras recommends two rate cuts before the summer. And if you look at the path forward for the Fed, a lot will also depend on what we've seen from oil. Now, oil markets, we're just getting this IEA report. I'm really looking forward to, as always, speaking to Toral Bozzoni of the IEA. They've just come out with their report, oil markets facing a supply deficit all year on OPLAS plug cuts. So let's get more from Toral Bozzoni, uh, the IEA's head of the oil market division, Toriel, as always, thank you so much for joining us. A lot of the focus, of course, is on, on, on what OPEC Plus will do. Are you assuming that the, the cuts will continue well into the end of the year? Good morning. Thank you. What we changed in this month's report, following the decision by the OPEC Plus to extend the cuts through the second quarter, and then... Uh, the announcement that they would only gradually unwind them uh, once the market conditions uh, warrant, we decided to hold them in place until the, the group announces or confirms that they will indeed uh, unwind the cut. But based on our own balances, we do show uh, some room for the, for the group to increase production later in the year. But, um, Toro, did you consult with OPEC Plus? I, I know it's a little bit un unusual. How confident are you that, that this is kind of the, the right base case? Well, so, so what we do, uh, until the, the OPEC Group um, Alliance, as they say, they will meet again in June, uh, and they would then decide, look at the market conditions, see how demand is going, see how non-opic supply is going, uh, and what room there is for them to increase um, their productions. So we are not saying what we think they will do. We don't, we're not saying what we think they should do. We're just putting in saying, until uh, the announcement, there is confirmation that they will unwind the cuts. We're just holding in, them in place in our market, uh, in our base case, to see what that looks like for the market. Yeah. So if OPEC Plus doesn't extend into the second half, does your outlook then tip into surplus? And what does the rest of the year look like then for oil demand and consumption? So the way we're looking at it now, in the third quarter, we have a deficit of about 700,000 barrels a day. So depending on when uh, the, the allowance does unwind the cuts, by how much, uh, at the pace of it, um, of course, then we will see we could have, uh, we could have a, a surplus in the second half of the year. Uh, but it depends really on the extent uh, also on oil demand growth and, and non big supply. So we will wait and see. Once the market uh, direction becomes clearer, uh, OPEC will look at um, the market themselves uh, and set the course for production policy for the end of the year. 
So your 2024 oil demand or uh, growth forecast is up some 50% since you introduced it last June. Much of the oil industry, of course, is, is seeing that. I'm looking at the numbers growing by at least 1.5 um, million. What does that mean in terms of some of, again, the forecast into the foreseeable future, two, three years down the line? I know it's extremely difficult to forecast, but how much of that, I guess, volatile demand comes from China? So our forecast for oil demand growth this year is about 1.3 million barrels a day. Uh, that's down from 2.3 last year. It's true we have increased uh, our, our forecast for this year uh, over the last few months as the uh, outlook for the global economy has improved, especially for the United States. Uh, the economic growth assumptions that, that feed into the forecast have improved. Uh, and, and the hard landing seems to now be avoided. We also increased the oil demand uh, growth for this year due to increased demand from, from shipping industry, uh, the closures or, or the diversions of, of ships around the Red Sea due to the unrest there and, and continued tanker attacks around the Cape of Good Hope is adding to uh, demand from tankers. And we also seeing that the tankers are increasing the speed to make up for the lost time. So, so this is one of the reasons why we have boosted oil demand growth this year. We are seeing a slowdown compared to last year and the year before uh, in the data. Uh, in this, in mid-2023, we had oil demand growth of more than 3 million barrels a day. That slowed to less than 2 in the fourth quarter, now 1.7 in, in the first quarter of this year. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing as the, um, the recovery from, uh, from the pandemic is running out of steam, uh, economic outlook is weaker this year than it was in 2023. Uh, and efficiency improvements, electric mm -hmm. vehicles, we do expect a, a steady deceleration in growth, but still growth in all demand uh, for the remainder of the year. Yeah. Uh, Toral, when will you see you know, normalization in energy flows through the Red Sea? Uh, it's difficult to see to to say we're seeing a continued attacks even last week we're seeing tankers being hit uh, by missiles and increasing numbers uh, of tanker owners are diverting uh, their ships around uh, Africa for for insurance reasons for safety reasons um, so it really depends on stability uh, in the region we do not see uh, a big shift um, back through the Suez Canal and the Red Sea until uh, the uh, security situation improves. Mm -hmm. So uh, given your forecast for deficits actually th this year, why do you think oil prices have been pretty much stuck so far in 2024? And are we still going to see moderate prices from now until the end of the year? Uh, it's a very good question. What we've seen, um, so we're seeing prices trending gradually upwards, uh, inventories on land, uh, are at, at the low level. They, for seven months, they've been declining. And this is also in part due to all the oil that is piling up on water, as we say, due to the diversions uh, around the uh, Red Sea. Um, so we are seeing um, uh, oil prices ticking upwards. If we're indeed seeing uh, oil inventories continuing to decline in the coming months, uh, if supply is not sufficient to meet demand, um, we do expect some increased pressure, upward pressure on, on prices, uh, but it depends. Uh, there's many factors at place. All the oil on water, uh, almost the highest since the, the, the height of the, the, the COVID pandemic. Once that comes uh, on shore, we could see a little easing, but it depends on the extent of the deficits that we will see uh, moving forward. Toro Bozzoni, as always, thank you so much for joining us. That was the IEA's head of the oil market division. Now, Bloomberg has also learned to talk about oil that Saudi Aramco is in talks to add top Wall Street banks for a secondary share sale in oil giant Aramco. Now, the kingdom reportedly plans to hire J.P. Morgan as one of the main underwriters to the offering. Bank of America and Morgan Stanley are also contending for lead roles on the deal, which could raise as much as $20 billion. Now, coming up, stocks muted as investors eye U.S. factory inflation data due today for fresh clues on the Fed's rate path ahead. We'll bring you analysis next, and this is Bloomberg.
Now, traders looking ahead to factory inflation data from the U.S. later today with retail sale numbers and initial jobless claims also due. Now, we're joined by Grace Peters, Managing Director and Global Head of Investment Strategy from J.P. Morgan Private Bank. Grace, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Now, we've had multiple highs on various indices. Are you still moderately pro-risk or is now the, the time maybe to take stock? And good morning. Good morning to you. Um, so, no, we came into this year risk positive specifically on equities um, and we've actually just upgraded our price target for the S&P European stocks as well as Japanese equities because the underlying data continues um, to be pretty resilient when we look at the state of the consumer when we look say at um, net household wealth in the US it's making new all-time highs in itself 156 trillion dollars and obviously you've got positive real wage growth also helping the consumer. So we think the combination of that um, resilient macro backdrop, but also with the corporate story being so strong about balance sheets, the ability to invest, to spend capex in key themes like artificial intelligence and, and security needs, um, means that there's still a good story to be had in equity markets. So Grace, what's the bull case, which you, you've kind of laid out, but if the S&P goes higher from here. Again, what supports it fundamentally and by how much can it still rise? I think the most realistic bull case to me is that corporate profits are stronger. Um, when we think about our base case expectations to get us to 5,300 on the S&P, we're looking for 8 to 9 percent earnings growth in 2024 and 2025. And a large part of that is technology, artificial intelligence, um, you know, procreating across various sectors. To get to a bull case, I think there's two ways to, to do that. As I say, the most realistic to me is that corporate profits come in stronger, that there's more operating leverage in the system and therefore you could get um, earnings growth um, that exceeds current expectations um, and that gets you to around 5,600 on the S&P. The other way to get to a bull case would be stronger disinflation, um, which would mean more um, rate cuts than the market's pricing that would support a higher multiple on equity indices. Um, I do think that the stronger profit um, scenario is the more credible, given what I said um, just a moment ago about the strength of the consumer and corporates at large. Um, but 5,600 would be what we're aiming for um, if you want to uh, push for a more blue sky scenario. Uh, Grace, there are many questions about Europe and whether now is the time actually to go longer on some of the European equities because we're seeing a rebound and, and things seem to be looking up. Of course, uh, you know, some say that this is going to be still a very difficult period for Europe because of the price of oil, because of what's happening in Ukraine. Are you more invested in Europe than you were two months ago? So Europe, I think, is a very interesting market. I think you do have to be more specific. And so what are we looking for for companies in Europe that we invest in? Um, it's companies that are very much um, aligned to these global themes. Um, Europe specifically has very strong exposure to premiumization um, in luxury goods and across other sectors, including autos, um, where you know, the, 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 the global household wealth picture can feed directly um, into the European corporate. So I think that's one theme that for us is evergreen in Europe and still absolutely stands today. But when we're thinking about technological driven themes, AI, semiconductors, Europe has a handful of companies. And also when we're thinking about industrials, some really strong industrial companies in Europe that very much feed into data center growth, um, supply chain reorientation, um, and automation at large. Um, so I think there's a lot to like in Europe. We tend to stick with the larger companies. So if you're thinking about at the index level, it would be the Eurostox 50 rather than the Eurostox 600. Um, but I think that even before we think about the European economy itself, there's much to like in European stocks. And then there is the possibility as well that the European economy mm -hmm. is starting to bottom out. The PMIs have positively um, inflected GDP, we think the same. Um, and therefore, even the story for European domestic businesses and, and the banks are in a much stronger position than they were um, if we go back to the decade post the great financial crisis. There's lots to go for actually in European companies um, as well. But Grace, is this again, is this because they've been undervalued for such a long time or is this also because there's capital markets union, there's a number of directives, regulation put in place that could make M&A more attractive and therefore bring prices up? 
So I definitely think the strength of the balance sheet that feeds into both the M&A and also the shareholder return story is key. When you look at the share buyback yield on European equities, um, we're pushing close to 2%. And of course, post the great financial crisis, Europe was very much a net issuer of equity. So I think there's been a fundamental change in the landscape um, for European balance sheets, um, which makes for an attractive investment proposition. I'd also say European businesses and their exposure to these global themes are very interesting. And of course, Francine, valuation as well. You know, when you're looking at Europe, on around 13 and a half times forward earnings compared to the US, closer to 19 times, if you've got businesses that can generate growth but trade at a discount, that is something um, that is increasingly attractive, particularly in a slightly higher inflation world um, where you need to be able to out-earn that cost of capital. Japan is, is, of course, in your obsession with everything else going on with possible monetary policy, trying to unwind this great experiment of the last 15 years. Do you see value and opportunities in Japan equities? Yeah, so I think the theme that unites Japan with Europe um, and also views that we have on the U.S. market is back to that balance sheet argument. And what we've seen in Japan is that cash has been trapped on balance sheets for a number of years. But because of various initiatives, actually some of that cash is starting to come back to shareholders. And that could be a multi-year story. So that combination of a little bit of reflation, um, corporate activity, um, returning money to shareholders, and a, a market that isn't quite as cheap as Europe on face value, um, if we're using a price earnings basis, but still looks attractively valued um, when you adjust for that cash. I think Japan is also an interesting market. And all of that's to say, Francine, that when we talk about equities making new highs that was um, part of our December outlook, that is beyond just the S&P. And we've had, I think, 16 all-time highs in the S&P so far this year. But that doesn't mean that investors shouldn't look beyond the US. Um, and I say particularly thinking globally about themes like balance sheet strength and buybacks, artificial intelligence and national security needs, security of supply that I think is structurally changed um, post the pandemic um, leads to lots of fruitful ideas. Yeah. Um, Grace, very quickly, just to round us off, there's you know, mixed signals, certainly in, in gold and, for example, what Bitcoin's been doing this week. How do you look at the market mood and, and the kind of appetite that there is out there? Does it bring opportunities for investors to, you know, to, I guess, be counter-cyclical or, or to change a little bit of where the money is going? Where does the smart money go? So I think that, you know, this is indicative of the fact that there has been cash held on the sideline that is waiting to get invested. Um, and I think as well, when we think about, you know, some of the more concept stocks, we would actually rather not chase unprofitable businesses. They've generally lagged um, so far in the rally. And so we know across the, the market, it's tempting to say, well, what hasn't moved up that I should now chase, um, given that markets have pressed ahead? Um, I think what I've mentioned so far is that we are quite inclined to stick generally with the winners so far. But if I were to look for a market that's lagged that we think is interesting, it would be mid-cap companies, particularly in the US, where you've still got a market that hasn't yet returned to previous highs and a valuation story as well, particularly earnings growth coming through next year. Grace, thank you so much. As always, Grace Peters, their Managing Director and Global Head of Investment Strategy at J.P. Morgan Private Bank. Now, coming up, the fate of TikTok is now in the hands of the U.S. Senate. We'll have plenty more on that next, and this is Bloomberg. Now, the U.S. House of Representatives has passed a bill to ban TikTok unless its Chinese owner sells a video sharing app. Now, its critics have accused the platform of being a national security threat, while TikTok CEO has called the decision disappointing in a video he posted on the site. Now, let's go straight to Bloomberg's Alex Webb now. Alex, 170 million Americans use TikTok. What's next for the bill? What does this mean for TikTok? So the next thing is it obviously has to somehow get through the Senate, and that looks like a far bigger challenge. It obviously passed through the House with a massive majority. There are still concerns about this in a number of different guises. There are concerns about whether it's infringing upon free speech. That's on both sides of the aisle. Republicans, just for free speech purposes, 
some people in the Democratic Party, um, such as Alessandra Azura Cortez, she uh, thinks that it's a place where really young people can express themselves. Uh, at, at the same time, you know, there are ways that politicians themselves communicate with young voters. This is a vector for that. So there are lots of reasons why it might have more difficulty getting through the Senate. It does, of course, still have its supporters there. What does it mean for TikTok? If it does somehow get through, it's more likely to be a divestment than it just shuts down completely. We know there are plenty of buyers out there. Okay, Alex, thank you so much. Alex Webb, of course, we'll have plenty more from Alex throughout the day. Of course, this plays also into the geopolitics between the U.S. And China. Now, coming up, after the world's largest assembler of iPhones posted a 33% jump in profits, we look at how Hanhai is becoming more of an attractive bet for AI. So, we'll have a full roundup of Hanhai profits. We'll also have a look at exactly what we're expecting from the Fed going forward. We'll speak to Monica Defend of Amundi and also then the Chief Investment Officer of Bank of America. We're here at their Capital Markets Forum in Rome. This is a Bloomberg. Stocks struggle for momentum as investors are U.S. factory inflation data due today for fresh clues on the Fed's rate path ahead. Meanwhile, the Greek central bank chief says the ECB must cut rates twice before the summer break. iPhone maker Hon Hai reports its second straight quarter of strong profit growth as AI demand lifts sales. Plus, the International Energy Agency says global oil markets face a supply deficit throughout the year instead of the surplus previously expected as OPEC Plus looks set to continue output cuts. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua, as always, but today we're in Rome for the Bank of America conference. Now, this is a picture across the board for U.S. futures. Again, we do have some data. The obsession with what the Fed does in inflation continues at U.S. future for the moment, uh, seeing a little bit of a lift off. S&P futures, three-tenths of a percent higher. NASDAQ, uh, four-tenths of a percent higher. Of course, on tech, the big story is 140 million users of TikTok. It's now in the hands, its fate is in the hands of a Senate. I think about 100 senators will decide whether they really need to sell or not. So we had a great roundup from Alex Webb on the fate of TikTok. Nets now talk to the iPhone maker Hunhai. It's reported a second straight quarter of strong profit growth after lucrative AI hardware sales helped really offset this weakness in demand for smartphones. And Taiwanese company is the world's largest assembler of Apple's iPhones. So let's go straight to Taipei to Bloomberg's Jane Lee. Jane, great to speak to you. So how do these results actually show um, how AI is driving that growth for Hanhai? Uh, well, the profit, the strong profit um, growth, it was up 33% on year for the fourth quarter. Uh, th that's a little bit, um, it's not completely clear because there was a giant one-off uh, uh, profit there, but uh, a, a one-off um, uh, profit uh, line. But what what we did see was a huge excitement uh, uh, during the earnings call about AI and where this company's AI future is going. The stock has risen about 15 percent just in the last week after um, some excitement that maybe, uh, you know, it's not been uh, put at the forefront as it should be um, with, with the AI story. Uh, and the chairman during the call said that uh, already in 2023, about 30 percent of its server revenue came from AI servers. And that's not completely clear uh, what that means is that also include uh, equipment that goes along with this, but that could be used for, you know, more traditional uh, servers. Is this extra special cooling equipment? That's not certain. But what is certain is there's a lot of excitement around AI uh, for Foxconn. So, uh, Jane, I mean, I guess the outlook, I was going to ask you about the outlook specifically for AI server business for Foxconn and the wider Asia market, but does it also point to a weakness in Apple demand in China, and how much does that expand? Right. I mean, that is the sort of the negative story in this whole thing. Uh, earlier this week or earlier last week, CounterPoint, uh, a data firm, uh, came out with numbers showing that the iPhone sales in China in the first six weeks were down nearly a quarter. Uh, and so that's gotten a lot of people worried. 
Um, and that will definitely take, you know, some edge off the growth going forward because it does make up more than half of, uh, of Foxconn or Huen Hai's um, uh, business. But uh, the company is very clear that it wants to grow the AI uh, business and it's aiming for 40% of the AI server market. Going forward, it's expecting to have some announcements next week at NVIDIA's GTC conference that NVIDIA is the chip company that is at the center of, of the, you know, the AI buzz here uh, today because it makes all the chips that train all of the open AI, um, uh, AI models and other models as well. So uh, investors will probably looking, be looking f forward to uh, what those announcements might be, and uh, we can, we'll all have to watch the stock uh, to see if it moves any further up. We will. Yeah, we will. Jane, thank you so much. Jane Lee there in Taiwan. Now, for a good conversation of interest rates, also after we heard from the ECB, Governor Yanis Tornaras uh, saying that the bank, the ECB, must reduce rates twice before its August summer break and make another two cuts before the end of the year. Now, the Greek central banker also said the ECB should not be swayed by the Fed. Let's bring in the head of the Amundi Institute, Monica Defend. Monica, as always, thank you so much for joining us here in Rome. It's a tough gig sometimes coming to Rome where it's, it's sunny to talk about central banks <laughs> and, and the inflation path forward ahead. I mean, there, there's so much concern that the ECB goes first. Does it actually make a difference for markets and to you whether the ECB cuts before the Fed? Honestly, it doesn't. Uh, after the pandemic, uh, we think that really the central banks have been to focus on their own business, on their own region uh, issues. Therefore, uh, I subscribe what uh, the governor said uh, on cutting twice uh, before uh, the summer. This is what is in our pipe. Then uh, we have 125 basis points towards year end meaning that the situation, the economic situation in Europe uh, seems to be less resilient than the, uh, than the U.S., and the focus has to be on inflation on both sides. I mean, the U.S. It seems, seems more than resilient if you look at all the measures, right, productivity, everything seems to be going the right way. Are, are you concerned that actually there's troubles brewing, that consumption maybe will, is not as strong as expected, especially in kind of, the, you know, the lower income earners? Well, uh, we do expect a slowdown in the U.S. economy kicking in, in the third quarter. So it is not uh, a technical recession anymore, but there will be a slowdown. There is a change into the narrative and probably the balance sheet. Uh, the balance sheets on the public sector, on the private sector, on the corporate sector are into play. And this uh, can alter a little bit the dynamic that we have been seeing so far. What is the market's misunderstanding the most? I know we spent now around 18 months, first of all, getting the call on the, uh, you know, the U.S. wrong. But also there's been this mismatch between what central banks were telling us and investors and what the markets were pricing in. Well, you know, on inflation, there was uh, a mistake out of the central banks. And broadly speaking, there has been a change in the way, in the framework, and uh, the way the, the dynamics of the economy are, are evolving. Excess savings, they were not there before. Uh, Front-loading uh, the investment on the corporate sector in the United States out of the IRA, it was not there uh, before. And again, the real estate played quite a role uh, in the balance sheet of the, of the households. While on the inflation, I would say that probably looking at some micro evidence, it was probably easier for us uh, to, to get uh, the change in the pattern and in the regime on inflation on the way up and now on the way down. Do, do you worry about 2025? Again, we're in a big election year, th you know, throughout the board, 4.5 billion people, I think, are going to the polls. That's almost, well, more than half almost of, of the world population. Is that going to be inflationary because people that are in charge are, are, don't want to lose the election? And then is there a worry that actually we don't really know what happens in 2025? Our story is the one uh, of inflation retracing progressively lower. It won't be uh, linear. Uh, the, the, what is at stake with elections is, as you were saying, that there might be a change in the, in the policy uh, framework. We see probably it's too late, but the market is not really uh, at the moment pricing in uh, the outcome of an election. Why? Because it's impossible to price in? Because the risks are too high, especially on geopolitics? Mm, no, I think that, that really there is still this obsession on inflation and on macro uncertainty. Uh, so it's a, probably a near-term thing. Uh, Going into the summer, I think the focus might change. Once the uh, central banks will be 
uh, formally pivoting, uh, then the attention will probably focus on the outcome of the, of the elections. Monica, how much time do you spend looking at, for example, Japan? I mean, there's a couple of idiosyncratic stories, or the UK, or is, is the general sense that actually we got away despite COVID, despite you know, some of the concerns out there, and that now the path forward globally is, is towards growth? We spend a lot of time, uh, meaning with this uh, macro uncertainty pending, it is really difficult to find top-down stories that play out. So it's time for idiosyncratic story. And Japan has been quite a surprise, uh, I would say. It was last year probably the corporate reform. Still, uh, it is something that is uh, at play. But there is an interesting uh, inflows into the equity market because of the changing in the uh, investors' appetite. I'm referring to the savings plan. So uh, this is going to, uh, to have a role. Uh, the yen, the central bank, still, uh, it is something... Uh, where uh, Japan is out of sample, <laughs> let's uh, um, say uh, this way. And in the UK, uh, yes, uh, probably this is again where the Bank uh, of England might uh, surprise, anticipating uh, a bit depending uh, on the mix between growth and inflation. I mean, they have a hard job, but again, it's also an election year, so I feel like it, it, it kind of, it could change the dynamics. It can, but still the central banks so far are leading the rope. Uh, so probably they are not the only game in town uh, anymore, but still they are leading the rope. Monica, as always, thank you so much for joining us. That was the head of the Amundi Institute, Monica Defend. Now, coming up, we talk more central banks. We'll have an exclusive conversation with Michael Hartnett, Bank of America's chief investment strategist. That interview is up next, live from the lenders' Global Investor Summit in Rome. And this is Bloomberg. I do try to think through what happens when Japan really does settle into a positive race. There will be winners and losers, um, and uh, corporate balance sheets and bank balance sheets, and, and the cost of the Japanese uh, Treasury funding its own debt will be a question. But I think it'll be a, a new paradigm which we haven't seen for a while, and I think that'll be interesting. <laughs> Well, that was Bank of America's international president, uh, Bernie Mensah, speaking to me a little bit earlier on the anticipation around the Japanese economy and treasury policies. Now, U.S. equities have scaled record highs this year, driven by the frenzy around AI and optimism about a pivot from the Fed. The gains have knocked analyst year-end stock forecast out of the park, leaving them scrambling to catch up. Well, joining us now to discuss this and much more, I'm pleased to welcome Michael Hartnett. He's Bank of America's chief investment strategist. Michael, as always, thank you for joining Bloomberg. Pleasure, Francine. Thanks Where's for having me. Where's the biggest mismatch? Where do you see the biggest buck for your money? Well, if there's a bubble, which it certainly sort of feels that's where the momentum is moving to, uh, often in bubbles, you find that a barbell strategy works works best. You obviously want to own what the bubble is, but the bubble will drag something in its wake. Right. So, for example, if you look in, you know, 1999, the only market that outperformed the Nasdaq was Russia. I mean, who'd have thought, right? But it did because it started the year on three times earnings and yeah. ended on six or seven. So what distressed asset is going to go up, yeah. you know, with AI it's, and all this sort yeah. of stuff? And it probably is going to be something like distressed tech or regional yeah. banks or even China. So, first of all, there is a bubble, right? You're, well, you're, are you seeing group, a bubble? There's, there's characteristics of a bubble. Right. It would make sense. In what? The Magnificent Seven? Yes. And, and AI-related stocks and, you know, you can see a little bit of it in crypto as well. I mean, there's yeah. tremendous euphoria. The euphoria yes. is there because Absolutely. of the Fed. The Fed wants to cut rates, no. come what may, you know, and, and the markets are front-running that in gold, in crypto, yeah. in equities, even in corporate bonds. But a bubble... You know, it's when too much money chases too few goods and everyone wants chips and there's a lot of money sort of chasing that. And, yeah, I think it has characteristics in terms of price, the speed of the movement, the valuation, the breadth. You know, bubbles are yeah. narrow, bull markets are broad. And Michael, this isn't I very mean, broad. A, a bubble could take like three, four years to of burst. Of course. What are we well, it doesn't necessarily but, have to pop right now. I mean, but do you think it pops right now? 
or what soonish? You, what would, well, first of all, we're going to find out a little bit in the next couple of months because there's no doubt that the macro data yeah. in the US is, 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 is becoming a little bit more ominous, particularly the labour market. There's no doubt that the labour market is cracking in the US. At the same time, there isn't a human being in America that thinks inflation is going to 2 percent because it's not. You know, it's stuck between sort of 3 and 4 percent. So that backdrop of, of inflation coming in a little higher than expected and growth coming in a little weaker than expected, that's normally not good for risk no. assets. But if risk assets say, we don't care, you know, we've got AI and all this sort of no. stuff, that is very yeah. symptomatic of the sort of bubble mentality. But at, at some point, again, when do they start caring? And there's also concerns about a Treasury auction going wrong because of the level yeah. of debt yeah, that, yeah. for the moment, everyone's ignoring. The trillion you know, dollar what is question. A, a trillion, well, it's a trillion <laughs> dollar question. It's the debt is going up a trillion dollars every 100 days. Just amazing, right? So, so yes, I mean, there's always that risk. There's always going to be risk abounding, but normally markets care because central banks make them care. Yeah. You know, it's either the, as the central bank says we need to pop that, or if the central bank hasn't got the backbone to pop it, yeah. real interest rates go up. Real interest rates in the U.S. ten year about two percent. I think if you got to two and a half, three, you'd really be challenging and putting a lot of pressure on the more speculative parts of the, the asset markets at this moment. Do you worry about liquidity in the markets? No, not now. No, I don't think so. I mean, I think, again, the debt story is more important because yes. I think that, that you, you know, bond yields can go up from here. Uh, again, look... To what kind of Well, I, don't th I, don't, I think if, if you don't get a recession and you have this debt and you have this spending and you have, you know, two... Uh, candidates in the election, neither of which are particularly interested in balancing the budget, you could certainly move towards 5% with, without a question. But if, you know, you, the, 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 you know, what no one expects now, there is a recession, there is a hard landing, the labour market may be sort of telling you actually is coming. Yeah. You know, obviously, that's not going to happen. That's the thing that makes bonds outperform. How do you see the, the US economy performing? Because there are also questions about you know, the, the bottom 25% yeah. of earners and yeah. their spending power. Can the top keep on sustaining this momentum? Well, part of the story, I mean, it's, it's twofold, isn't it? It's fiscal yeah. and the labour market. The fiscal story just continues to be off the charts. I think just in the past five months, um, you know, we're here in Rome. Rome, I think, has a GDP of about $300 billion, you know, dollars. The American government has spent $350 billion on, on military equipment just in the past five months. I mean, the spending is, you know, just very, very strong and is, is stimulatory. But the labour market, I think, is cracking. And I do worry a little bit that, again, everyone's expectation for a, a warm, cuddly, soft landing the labour market is the thing that, that, that can take a soft landing and make it a hard landing very, very uh, quickly, if that quite cracks. So what, what does that mean for the Fed? They're, well, they're... the Fed would have to cut. I mean, the, obviously, if unemployment uh, was rising, if you move, sort of move, move in unemployment towards 4.5%, yeah. the Fed would have to cut. The Fed would cut aggressively. Is that positive for the markets? Much less so. I mean, right now, the Fed, you, you know, the market's rallying, the Fed's going to cut, and there'll be a soft landing. If... The Fed's cutting because unemployment's rising and the payroll's falling. That's much more negative for asset prices, without question. All right, hold that thought because I have many more questions, All Michael, right. but we do need to take a break. Thank Michael Hartnett, Bank of America's chief investment strategist, staying with us, and this is Bloomberg. Welcome back, everyone. Still with us, Michael Hartnett. He is Bank of America's chief investment strategist. Michael, thank you for sticking around. We're having a, a good conversation about uh, some of the weirdness in the market. Yeah. We're talking about gold going up, Bitcoin at a record. What does that tell you about where the market's head is at? I think that's representative of a feeling that the Fed is, is losing credibility, that um, the Fed seems very determined to cut interest rates before it reaches its 2% inflation target. We know inflation 
just in the last month or two have started re-accelerating. And so I think if the Fed is really saying, we've got to cut, we've got this window of opportunity in the first half of the year, we've got to take it just in case, I, I think that makes people nervous about the Fed's credibility. It also makes people nervous about the dollar. And, you know, if you're looking for hedges against the dollar and, and hedges against, you know, further debt problems in the US, crypto and gold fit that bill. And, and I think part of their attraction is really that. How do you model the U.S. election, depending on who wins? Well, it's, it's I mean, it's going to be tight. Um, you know, I think we know that. Um, I think in the first half of the year, the markets sort of look at the election in the U.S. There's elections in other important places as well, like India, um, as a positive. I think they think that, that at the margin, it makes monetary, fiscal, certainly energy policy likely to be easier than it would otherwise have been if it wasn't an election year. So I think part of the, the zeitgeist right now is that the elections are bullish because it means a little bit more stimulus. I think in the second half, certainly the US election, I think if it's Trump winning, all other things being equal, the market sort of thinks lower yields, lower dollar. I think if it's Biden winning, it means high yields, higher dollar. Because you think about the conclusion of who wins. You know, Biden wins with, with high inflation but low unemployment. He's just going to say, well, high inflation doesn't matter. All I've got to do is keep unemployment low. Spend, spend. Whereas if Trump wins, he's going to say, well, I won because inflation was too high. I've got to get it lower. So I think who wins and the conclusions they draw is going to be quite important as to how the market sort of trades that. But does Donald Trump, for example, tear up the Inflation Reduction Act? And does it, well, I know... don't think he's... I don't know that that's his, his, his plan. I mean, I think he's got certainly differences with regard to Biden and with regard to taxes and various other things. But, you know, the bottom line, if you think about it, they're both... Uh, you know, neither of them are kind of going to run on... I'm going to balance the budget and, and, you know, both of them are going to run in, in terms of like we're going to be tough on China and generally have American first policy. So I think, again, it adds to this story that the 2020s is just going to be a decade where the cost of capital and inflation is higher than it has been the past 20 years. Michael, very quickly, what do you do with China right now? Well, I think China looks quite attractive, to be honest with you. And they're kind of ironically in a, a US election year, because I think that, that most of the bad news is, is into the Chinese market. I think it's starting to perform a little better. My favorite way of playing it is a little bit like, like the other markets have been played, where you buy you know, the best companies. And you, we've seen that in Europe. We've seen that in the US. Um, you know, and, and there are lots of good well, companies. What you like TikTok is, you know, could, could be about to be sold off. I mean, yes, I mean, I mean, the, 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 there's always these idiosyncratic risks, and I, I get again the the, the 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 case against China. But again, I think that that if again, as I was saying earlier, yeah. things will be lifted up by the general euphoria. And I think Europe, you know, China seems one of those good candidates. Michael, thank you so much, Michael Hartnett, there, Bank of America's chief investment strategist. Now that's it from Rome for now. But surveillance is up ahead, and this is Bloomberg. Mm -hmm.